Hello there friends, welcome back to another episode of Generation Tech. My name is Alan. Have you ever wondered what a Jedi aspires to be? It's kind of a weird question. Well, I'm sure a lot of young folk aspire to be a Jedi, especially during the Clone Wars or Republic period. It's not really something you could work towards, right? You're either born force sensitive or not. And when you're born a Jedi, hopes and dreams can actually get you into trouble. The Jedi's path in life has been chosen for them already. It's a life that promises great purpose, but one that also requires immense personal sacrifice. This includes the suppression of emotions, feelings, and of course, ambition. A Jedi could not dream of power, fame, or riches. The pathway is already set before them and carefully documented. Now there is a hierarchy, a chain of command for these humble warrior monks, of course. It's not a complete free for all. And so I guess every Jedi's most basic goal is to find themselves in that hierarchy and progress. A Jedi youngling who is talented enough to attract the attention of a master can become a Padawan. Actually, a big percentage of Jedi didn't even make it to that stage, so becoming a Padawan was a big deal. Now, a Padawan gets to learn and progress, and eventually they will learn enough that they will be allowed to venture off on their own as a Jedi Knight. Maybe one day they'll even take their own apprentice. Now, for those who truly fit into the Jedi Order's way of thinking and doing things and are skilled enough Becoming a Jedi Master is not that far off. And for those who performed exceptionally well as a Master and are in good graces with the leadership, then perhaps a seat on the High Jedi Council is in order. This is the most powerful rank a Jedi could rise to within the organization. And if you wanna make a big impact in the galaxy or even make changes to the institution of the Jedi Order, this is a great place to start. Perhaps this is what every Jedi dreams about, a seat at the high table, you know, a reward for all of their service over the decades. But it's not every Jedi's dream. All throughout galactic history, there have actually been a handful of individuals who have rejected a seat on the council, who have rejected leadership. And as you'll see, each one of these individuals have their own reason for not taking on this responsibility of leadership. And what you'll also notice is that towards the end of the Republic, the end of the Jedi Order during the Clone Wars, we'll see a rise in people refusing to serve in the Jedi Council, a sign of all the trouble that was brewing beneath the surface of this organization. From very early on, Dooku's Royal Sereno blood put him at odds with the Jedi Order's philosophy. I mean, he was a pretty good-natured kid, and despite the fact that he'd been taken away from his parents at such a young age, there was just something very noble about him from day one. Dooku had a very strong ego, he had a very strong sense of self and purpose, and he was also naturally gifted. This led to him being a natural leader and not a follower. And as a result, young Dooku would always clash with the Jedi Order and have problems fitting in. A fellow youngling in his year called Arath Terex would oftentimes make fun of Dooku and call him his excellency. Even at that age, Dooku tended to act quite sophisticated and he also spoke with an aristocratic tone that felt kind of off within the Jedi Order. But Dooku was well motivated and he was very skilled in many aspects of the Force. He would keep his head down, train hard, and prove to not just himself, but everyone around him just how capable he could be. Dooku's skill was recognized by the High Jedi Council and eventually he would be offered a seat. But Dooku would initially refuse because he wanted to remain free to pursue missions in the field as a proactive peacekeeper. While most Jedi allowed the Force to guide their actions, Dooku was too impatient to wait for some kind of cosmic sign. He was politically astute and confident in his own abilities to judge situations. He believed in himself and his ability to make the galaxy a better place. But there was something darker driving Dooku's determination. You see, around this period, a lot of the Jedi within the Order were being bombarded by dark visions of the future. This was most likely a vision of the Clone Wars, Order 66, and all the other terrible things that would happen to the Jedi in the coming years. And Count Dooku's own uh, best friend, Sifo Dyas, another Jedi, was known for having very strong visions, like all the time. And Dooku would be convinced by his friend's visions that turmoil would eventually engulf the galaxy, and so he would become infatuated by Jedi prophecies for the future. Armed with these prophecies, Count Dooku's arrogance, ego, along with a genuine desire to make the galaxy a better place, led to a growing sense of dissatisfaction in the Jedi Order. Dooku looked all around him and saw the Jedi's growing failure and incompetence. And while Dooku was quite successful in the individual missions he went on, there was only so much that one person could 
could do. And even then, constantly immersing yourself in struggle and some of the worst situations in the galaxy on a daily basis took a toll on the mind. The sight of so much cruelty, chaos in the galaxy made Dooku feel helpless and eventually turned him bitter and angry. I will destroy this town and make an example of it and many others. None shall defy me, not even you, Master Jedi. Later on in his career, Dooku would again be asked to join the Jedi Council, and this time he would actually accept. But getting access to the inner circle of the Order only made Dooku even more resentful of their behavior. The truth is, the Sith were secretly coordinating massive unrest in the Outer Rim territories, making things even more chaotic than usual for the Jedi. And as a result, the Jedi were being forced to make more and more tough decisions. Oftentimes decisions they really shouldn't have been making or they weren't prepared to make. And this led to a lot of bad results caused by the Jedi. Dooku disliked how closely connected the Jedi had become to the Republic and its many business interests. The Jedi were now not only working on behalf of the Republic and its people, they are also quickly becoming a tool for the rich and powerful in the galaxy to use. When Crisis emerged on his home planet of Sereno, Dooku reclaimed the title of Count of Sereno and decided to leave both the Jedi Council and Order. His hope at the time was to help his people, not just as a swordsman or a warrior, but as a politician and statesman a role in which he believed he had much greater power to effect change. The death of Qui-Gon Jinn years later would only confirm to him that he made the right choice. Now, we briefly mentioned how sifo Force Visions help make Kanduku curious about the phenomenon of Jedi prophecies. But we should also mention that sifo at least for a period of time, was a very well-respected Jedi Master in his own way. He might have been a bit erratic, but having such powerful connection to the Force is the only reason why sifo was able to see into the future, and so he was considered quite a powerful individual. And so in 39, BBY sifo would join the Jedi High Council, but with his newfound role in the leadership, sifo would double down on his doomsday prophecies, especially during the lead-up to the crisis on Naboo. While everyone else was trying to focus on other things, sifo would advocate on a daily basis the creation of an army for the Republic in preparation for an upcoming full-scale conflict. I mean, to give you some context, at the time, the galaxy had not seen a major war for a thousand years, and the Republic had not had a federal military for a thousand years, and so, Having sifo come to the Jedi Council meetings every day asking for an army was not only getting people really annoyed, it was probably starting to worry a lot of people as well. It's not that people didn't believe in sifo visions. He actually had a lot of big visions that came true, including the destruction of the planet Proto Branch. What bothered the Jedi, including Yoda, was that they believed that prophecies oftentimes were too vague for people to truly act on. Even though sifo had predicted the destruction of Proto Branch correctly, the Jedi were unable to do anything to save the people on that planet. It was also a widely held belief that fear of knowing the future could actually lead to some pretty dark side behavior. And so sifo would eventually be removed from the High Jedi Council. He would spend the next few years trying to contact the Kaminoans in an attempt to create an army for the Republic. We all know Grandmaster Yoda. He spent centuries on the Jedi High Council, and in a lot of ways, it was his hand that guided the Jedi towards disaster in the waning moments of the Galactic Republic's rule. Ironically, uh, a few hundred years before that happened, Yoda actually took a sabbatical, and that period was known as like a golden age for the Jedi. I don't really think that's a coincidence, but you know. Now, Yoda was not the only member of his species to sit on the council. You see, there was also a female member of Yoda's species uh, with him, and her name is Yaddle. And she actually speaks like a normal person, which makes me think that Yoda is either trolling everyone or has some, like, neurological speech issues. Born in 509 BBY, Yaddle is about half the age of Yoda, and like Yoda, she's really interested in working with younglings. During the High Republic era, both Yaddle and Yoda would spend quite a lot of time developing Jedi initiates and helping them with their earlier training. Like Yoda, she would have several apprentices through her lifespan, including council member Opal Rancis and Jaro Tapal. Yaddle would be given a seat on the High Jedi Council in the last years of the High Republic period. When Qui-Gon Jinn approached the Council with news of the appearance of a Sith Lord on the planet of Tatooine, the first sighting in nearly a thousand years, Yaddle was one of the few individuals on the Council that believed them. Yaddle was always seen as a very empathetic and wise individual. She was also known for, you know, sticking by her principles, even 
if it meant that abandoning her principles could lead to some short-term gains. In the chaotic last years of the Jedi Order, Yaddle could have been a beacon of hope, a reminder to the Jedi that even when the world around them changed, that they should have just stuck to their principles, concentrated on the Force rather than politics and war. Now, Yaddle was not a confrontational individual. She wasn't political but she recognized that the more hawkish members of the Jedi Council were beginning to seize control, individuals like Mace Windu and Ki Adi Mundi. And although she greatly respected and admired Yoda, Yano would eventually resign from the High Council in the aftermath of the Battle of Naboo. And this was partly due to where she saw the Jedi Order heading, and this was partly due to the death of Qui-Gon Jinn. Yaddle actually had conversations with Dooku about this. Dooku had been furious that the Council did not take the threat of the Sith more seriously when Qui-Gon Jinn brought it to them. Yaddle believed that the Jedi Council was increasingly making decisions based on politics rather than decisions based on the principles of the Force. After stepping down from the High Jedi Council, Yaddle would also become less and less involved with the Jedi Order's day-to-day -day activities. Around the time of Qui-Gon Jinn's funeral, Yaddle would confront Dooku when he was secretly meeting with Darth Sidious and would try to to intervene. She would meet her end at the hands of the former Jedi from Serana. Already so many have suffered for what you call order. Then let me give you peace, Master Yaddle. <laughs> A lot of these stories so far seem to revolve around Qui-Gon Jinn. And while other Jedi did die during this period, the death of Qui-Gon Jinn at the hands of a Sith assassin was scandalous. Scandalous for reasons we already presented. Qui-Gon Jinn had warned the Council and no one had believed him, but also scandalous because of who Qui-Gon Jinn was and what people believed he could have become. First, he came from the lineage of Dooku, who himself came from the lineage of Yoda. As in, this was a very special lineage within the Jedi Order. These Jedi were supposed to achieve greatness, which actually gives us more insight about how the Jedi Council worked. There were probably around 10,000 Jedi Knights at the height of the Republic with thousands more support staff and other Jedi personnel. There are only 12 individuals who sat in the Jedi Council, and five of those individuals held lifelong positions. The fact that all of the individuals on this list were very close to each other and all sat on the Jedi Council at one point in time shows us that maybe there is some type of nepotism going on. Actually, no, that's not the right word. Um, but I guess it's important who you know when it comes to getting appointed. Anyway, let's not get sidetracked. Uh, Qui-Gon Jinn, just like his predecessors, would be quite the unorthodox Jedi. Instead of being concerned about the ongoing political upheaval and chaos in the galaxy, Qui-Gon Jinn was focused on becoming more intimately connected to the Force. His path would be an extremely important one, one that uncovers many ancient Force techniques that will actually help the Jedi Order survive, Order 66. The problem was more conservative members of the Jedi Council frowned upon this type of exploration. With growing unrest in the Outer Rim and their connection to the Force clouded, the High Jedi Council saw Qui-Gon Jinn as a threat. Qui-Gon Jinn in many ways reminded me of the Jedi of old, who respectfully explored the Force and all it had to offer. It wasn't about fearing one side of the Force back then, it was more about finding balance within oneself and understanding what the Force actually was. As Qui-Gon Jinn learned to trust himself more and more, he grew to view the Jedi Code as sort of a guideline more than an actual law. And the Jedi Council started seeing him as a maverick. Heck, Qui-Gon Jinn's own apprentice, Obi-Wan Kenobi, started seeing him as a maverick. Do not defy the Council Master, not again. I shall do what I must, to be one. If you would just follow the code, you would be on the council. They will not go along with you this time. What Obi-Wan Kenobi didn't realize was Qui-Gon Jinn had already been invited to join the Jedi Council many years earlier, and Qui-Gon had actually refused. You see, despite his very roguish and maverick nature, Grandmaster Yoda was smart enough to understand that having a diverse group of opinions and voices on the High Council could only benefit the Jedi. And so he reached out to Qui-Gon and wanted his unorthodox views within the leadership. And this could have really helped the Jedi out, I think. But by then it was already too late. Qui-Gon Jinn understood what his own path would be and that the future of the Force lay outside of the confines of the Jedi Order's restrictive halls. Qui-Gon Jinn was seeking the ancient method of becoming one with the Force, and the spiritual journey that he needed to take to get there meant that he didn't have time for the politics and bureaucracy that came with a Jedi Council seat. Meow. Lastly, we have Deepa Balaba, 
Padawan of Mace Windu, and Master of Kanan Jarrus. She also belongs to an incredibly important lineage within the Jedi Order. And she, like other members who stepped down from the Council, was constantly at the forefront of the Jedi's attempt to bring peace and stability to the galaxy. And at the same time, she was really uncomfortable with the Jedi's role as peacekeeper for the Republic. What makes her even more interesting is the fact that she actually joined and left the Jedi Council many times. Her first stint would occur in the decades leading up to the Naboo Crisis. She would be a part of the Council that rejects Anakin's first application to the Order. When the Clone Wars starts a decade later, Deepa Balaba would give her seat up to Kit Fisto for unknown reasons. But then with the death of even Peel during the Citadel rescue, Deepa Balaba would return back to the Council in 20 BBY in this seat. She would leave just a year later in 19 BBY and be replaced by Stas Ali. Her last departure from the Jedi Council was involuntary. She had been badly injured during the Republic campaign on the world of Harun Kal. Harun Kal was the homeworld of Mace Windu, her master, and it was probably one of the most dangerous places in the galaxy. Seriously, just look up Harun Kal a little bit more and you'll understand why Mace Windu is Mace Windu. Now, during that campaign, uh, Deepa Balaba would face General Grievous and his droid army, and her forces would suffer almost 90% casualties. It was a horrendous campaign for her. Deepa Balaba would hardly survive the battle herself and would remain in a coma for six months as a result. And during that time period, of course, she couldn't sit on the Jedi Council. We're not really sure why Deepa Balaba uh, joins and leaves the Jedi High Council so many times in a decade. My running theory is an individual like her rather be out in the field where she can actually feel like she's doing something to help people. But most likely members of the council saw that she would be valuable in a leadership position because of her calm and wise demeanor. And I'm gonna go on a limb and say that I think specifically Mace Windu wanted his former apprentice alongside of him in the council, not only because they have that shared history, but maybe because there is an attempt by Mace Windu to build factions within the Jedi High Council. That's a pretty big accusation, something I'll have to do more research about, but there is a possibility. Anyway, guys, uh, those are some of the more famous individuals who have rejected or left the High Jedi Council. Let me know in the comment section below if I've missed any of your favorite rogue Jedi masters. Also, don't forget to subscribe and hit that notification button down below so you don't miss out on the rest of our awesome content. As usual, my name is Alan, reminding you that my allegiance is to the Republic to democracy. See you next time.